Today we're going to be talking about the objectification buy-in of women. Objectification buy-in. It's the subtle acceptance of being reduced to an object. It's when women, consciously or unconsciously, adopt behaviors that diminish them, reinforcing stereotypes to survive in male-dominated spaces. This buy-in affects us deeply, perpetuating a cycle that limits our potential. But what if we didn't have to accept this role? Dr. Walker Green's message calls us to challenge these norms, to question the beliefs we've internalized, and to reclaim our true identities. By discussing objectification buy-in, we can break this cycle, reclaim our agency, and redefine our worth. Join the conversation. Let's reject narratives that undermine us and step boldly into a future where we define ourselves. The Unstoppable Shiro. Reclaim your narrative. We're going to be talking about this today, and we have a beautiful panel. It's going to be six women, some of us also millennials. We're going to dive into this. So stay tuned for some very, very important information, very insightful information that you can use to just think about the objectification buy-in of women. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lin Law, founder of the Asian Americans Leadership Council. Uh, I have devoted 20 years to serving the AAPI community, especially to nurturing young female leaders. And I'm thrilled to be here today to discuss such a crucial topic. And my background is uh, rooted very deeply in advocating for inclusivity and equity, particularly in the communities where the societal expectations can often overshadow individual identity and worth. And also my PhD dissertation I'm doing now uh, is researching how inclusive leadership can support Asian American women leader in civic engagement uh, within the nonprofit organizations. This work aligns with today's discussion as I examine how societal pressure impacts self perceptions and uh, uh, leadership potential. Through my work, I hope to contribute to dismantling the limiting narrative uh, and fostering spaces where uh, individuals can be valued beyond appearance, enabling everyone to thrive authentically. Thank you for having me, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Awesome. I can tell you my dissertation, I did a lot of studies that brought me into this arena where, you know, the promotion of women our leadership skills, our leadership ability is challenged on a constant basis, right? We play by different rules. The playing field is not level by any means. So you're, it's really great to have you on here with the studies that you're doing because it's going to reveal a lot to us as well. So now, uh, Trinity, you want to introduce yourself? Hi everybody, my name is Trinity James and I'm a senior biology major at Kirby a &M University. And I'm also from Houston, Texas. And I also have the privilege to serve as a college ambassador for the Safe Diversity Communities Organization. And I'm very honored to be here to speak about a topic that is very important, especially in today's day and age. And because it's something that negatively impacts women and girls. So I think it's very important to discuss. So. But basically, um, my background is in finance and wealth management. And I about uh, 2018, I went back to school and got my doctorate degree. And I studied women's empowerment, basically, and the rise to the C-suite. And, and um, is mentorship or uh, coaching the best method for getting us there? More or less, it was, it was researching why women are not progressing to the C-suite as aggressively as they should, especially with us being one of the highest educated sexes, right? Women are more highly educated than men uh, uh, in numbers, greatly so. So why is it that? And of course, you know, uh, salaries and things like that, we're still behind on. So my research took me down a path of seeing things and reading things that really still just blow my mind when it comes to how 
society looks at women as leaders. And we just witnessed that in the in the political arena, how you know a woman a woman can say something and it is taken one way and a man can say something is, is totally accepted. And that's been the way it has been you know, throughout time. My book, uh, The Unstoppable Shiro, dives into these concepts, it's particularly objectification, narcissism, some other things. But tonight we're talking about the objectification buy-in because I really, really want to spread this word, word out there into the world that it's so important that women understand exactly how they're affecting not only themselves and their agency and how the world perceives them as leaders, but also what they're passing to the next generation. What type of messaging are they passing to young girls that we are responsible for, whether we like it or not? If we're out there in a public space and we're influencing what people see and hear, we have a responsibility. So it's really important for women to have this conversation and to have it more often than they may be even comfortable with to really face the fact that this type of behavior, it, it stifles our growth and it stifles the, the changes in society of the way they look at women. So that is the reason why we're going to be talking tonight about objectification buy-in. Now, just staying on, on topic, I would like each of you to... Uh, Describe to me what the objectification buy-in means to you. And the, how do you look at it? And how are you uh, framing it for this conversation? And we'll start with you, uh, Ling. Thank you. Uh, to me, my understanding of, of the objectification buy-in refers to the phenomenon where individuals, especially women, internalize societal standards that equate their worth to the physical appearance or sexual appeal. This buying often leads individuals to confirm to the narrow beauty standards, which can reinforce self -ob objectification and promote behaviors that align with, that, with these uh, external expectations. For many, it can stem from societal messaging and the media influences prioritizing physical appearance over other qualities. We see lots of examples like that. Objectification buying can be conscious or unconscious, perpetuating a cycle of self-assessment based on appearance. Thank you. And Trinity, from your perspective, and, and you're a young lady, Yes, yeah, so I think pretty much objectification is the action of degrading somebody um, and like reducing their status to just an object. And I think when you add in that buy-in piece, it's pretty much, again, what the uh, other panelists was saying was that it encourages women to like then internalize that and to want to live up to these standards that are set. And that if you don't live up to the standards then you're pretty much seen as worthless and you don't have any value in society. And I think it's contributing to a lot of negative um, self-image issues that we see in women and girls. And so, yeah. Take the next step to discover the Shiro within you. Take the Shiro personality quiz to uncover your unique Shiro type. Find out if you are a badass, an intellectual, a leader, nurturing, or a silent Shiro. Click the link in the description to take the quiz. Laura, give us your idea of what it means, what the objectification buy-in means to you. I kind of look at it more as not so much about what men are thinking about, about us so much, but I think as women, and something I've actually done in the past uh, without being consciously aware until I was, uh, to utilize looks appearance you know in order to like to make better sales or to get into a door so it was more about you know first first it's how you look and then then you had to show that you actually had a brain you know you you actually had some smarts and and the ability to be able to think on your feet like like other men would do in the industry or in anything really um but i typically am around men uh, ninety percent men every day, so it's um, 
it's not as much of a big deal as I guess I because I've been around it so much um it just has helped me really learn how men think as well so I really don't have much to say when it comes to all of that I look at it very differently than and my experience has been different than I guess most people right is that because you around men more often yes Yes, right. Get get to know and get to understand how men think, how they act, how their emotions of everything, you know, because it's just a day to day. I've just basically become just one of the guys, you know. So. Right. Well, I think with this conversation, though, the objectification buy in is women themselves about the unconscious or conscious buying in of women themselves into their own objective. So um, now we have Miss Edna with us. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Edna Griggs, um, retired from AT&T, 42 years. Uh, started um, an organization called Acres of Angels, um, which we've been doing since I retired in 2012, and helping the community, helping the seniors and our children in uh, low-income areas. Glad to be here. Right into this conversation. So if you can add to it what your feelings about the objectification buy-in are, what does that mean to you? What does it speak to you? Well, I kind of came into it when you guys were talking and I had had the opportunity as well to work around uh, men most of my most of my career with AT&T and it's always that you had to fight to really be able to be heard. Uh, a lot of times you were tuned out. Um, you know, you could speak up, but no one listened. So you had to learn to actually um, really speak out, speak up to have a voice uh, around that surrounding. Okay, but in terms of objectification, uh, we're talking more about how women objectify themselves. What? How do you see that whole buy-in situation when it comes to women themselves buying into the mindset of objectification, whether conscious or unconscious? Well, I, I guess I feel that uh, sometimes uh, women... Um, they feel like they're not being heard um, in in situations that they're not, you know, that they're they're they not feel comfortable uh, that they're they're being heard. So that's that's kind of I guess where where you're coming from, I guess, with that. Um, so they use their sexuality to get attention to be heard. Is that what you're saying? To be, yes, to be, yes, to actually be heard. A lot of times is that I, I feel that um, women use their sexuality to, to attract attention to people instead of just really being themselves. And that's pretty much been true throughout history, right? Back to the Roman Correct. Empire, you know? So yes. there's nothing new about it, right? But today, right. as women today, we realize our worth. And we realize that our worth is beyond our physical beauty. We know how smart we are. So, you know, for a group of women or a mindset of women to still feel like they have to objectify themselves so blatantly, I mean, we all want to feel beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with putting on a beautiful dress and, and feeling sexy and all of that. So I just, I want to make the point of the extreme objectification. And most of it is probably very small because, you know, the media decides what we see. So we could be looking at 0.001% of all women that expose themselves with twerking and being half dressed and just 
the way we see people objectify themselves in social media, but it seems huge because it's put out there in the forefront all the time. So that's a, one of the things that makes it kind of difficult. And Trinity, I'm just really curious as to what your thoughts are on that, because you're, you're really living it, right? This is your mm -hmm. generation of women we're talking about, basically. Um, so give me some insight, give me some feelings about what we have all said to this point. Yeah, I think I agree with pretty much all of the panelists. And I think that the focus on how we buy into it is very important to discuss because I think we, how you were already saying that we know like what the male gaze is and how, you know, women appeal to that, but like how we like consciously or subconsciously buy into that as well is very important. And I think it's because I think some people, they might not think that they're affected by it, maybe because they're not out there and really doing the most with it but i think like a, you can also be affected by on your daily life i mean in your daily life on like a smaller basis and i think also with social media it's become like a really big thing too just because i think it exasperates the problem because it's very easy to you know scroll on social media and see who's being praised and who it looks like people value more and like basing your worth off of like maybe how many likes you get or how many views you get. And then if you're not meeting that, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of um, impacts your self worth. So yeah, I think um, in my generation, it's pretty um, apparent just because of like how social media is. And yeah. Hmm. Right. And um, Ling, I'm interested because you're actually doing some research in this area. Can you tell me what groups you're finding that fall into this category? Is it more of a uh, ethnic thing or age thing or economic situation? What are you finding in your research? Um, my, uh, my research is uh, more about uh, inclusive leadership. Uh, how it influenced uh, uh, Asian American uh, women leaders uh, development. And then uh, aligning with today's topic, I think the most uh, influenced or affected group are women and young girls that tends to be most impacted due to this uh, per a pervasive focus on their appearance in media and culture, especially in Asian culture, we were all looking up outside to the Western culture because the Western culture tends to be more romantic and the westernized uh, living styles and that have very big impact in the, uh, in the for me, my background is Chinese. Uh, before our uh, country opened to the outside world, we were very traditional, very uh, uh, conservative. We don't wear clothes that can expose our bodies very much. We were very uh, closed up. And after the open to the outside world, people already feel like, wow, look at that, so beautiful. And uh, the, the, trend, the, the trending of the uh, styles, you know, the modeling, the, the, the Western style movies have very important impact on the uh, on the young ladies they're starting to uh, mimicking and wearing the clothes to the, uh, similar to the western style and all the fashion business are uh, pouring into china so our girls object uh, objectificate themselves and then buy in particularly in that cultural uh, i say invasion <laughs> so the self uh perspective, self-awareness is forming at that, at that, uh, uh, in that type of uh, uh, cultural influx into the country. So the young ladies, young individuals, when they are still forming the sense of self and highly you know, influenced by the social norms, the social norm already changed. The media portrayed that these type of women, they tend to have a better life, to be successful and have a good future. And then all young girls are trying to follow those steps and learn from them. And so individuals from the marginalized backgrounds may experience the compounded effects as they navigate intersecting societal expectations and the stereotypes. These will impact the self-worth and the self-image. 
I, I tend to feel a different vibe coming from you. Talk to us a little bit about what you're feeling about some of the comments. I was saying I'm getting a different vibe from what you expressed and what you uh, explained to us about the buy-in and how it's kind of, it's almost like um, nonchalant, if you will, in terms of so what, you know, men are men, they're going to be men. And I totally agree with that because we can't change who we are and we can't change our feminineness and our, our want to be beautiful. So in your experience working around men mostly, are you finding that easier to deal with because you don't have so many women around? I lose a lot of the femininity because I have to be just as strong and just as, you know, forceful and, and dictatorship, whatever you, uh, as the next person, you know, I have to make sure that I don't allow the feminine and the sexiness or the, you know, the prettiness to, to actually become a factor in my day to day. Cause it actually would make me lose the effectiveness of being a that's something that that's another big piece of my book for another podcast of how we have to conform to fit into the male organizational culture, which is another topic, but that that's a very real thing. And Miss Edna, you know, I see you agreeing. Do you have something to add to that conversation as far as the age groups or the economic status of the women that you find or you see as buying into objectivity? Yeah, and I have a uh, granddaughter who's 23 as well. So uh, being around her a lot uh, and seeing that she deals with that every day, um, it's really right now she's working in a law office and uh, it's mostly men. And, you know, she has to deal with that coming home, uh, trying to really keep from, she's very outspoken, more uh, activist, <laughs> like her grandmother. So it's hard to sit in a room, you know, and you're hearing all these things that they're talking around you and not being able to speak out. Uh, working uh, for at and and going into the field of where men's were because we wanted to make the money that they were making. So we had to apply and get these jobs. Well, once we got out there, they were mostly all men. So, you know, we caught, we, we had to fight to really be able to uh, keep those jobs because, you know, we were, uh, it was a lot of discrimination uh, as far as uh, the sexism in, in, in the workplace. So it was really hard. So, you know, we had to fight. And I think that's, that's what happened, like I tell her, at 23, starting into a new a job, uh, dealing where she is in a law office where it's men, that that's what she's going to have to do. She's going to have to stand up to them because if she don't, then they'll definitely just run over her. Now about how this objectification buy-in harms the Shiro evolution. And let me just say a little bit first about what is the Shiro evolution, right? And again, I'm going to take Sorry, it has an echo and I can't hear myself. But basically the Shiro evolution is where women are coming to their own since the beginning of time. When we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Women are out there, they have been fighting for rights and since day one, we, we have this whole evolution going on where women fight for what we want, what we believe in. So through the ages, you know, not being able to vote, being the husband's property, not being able to own property, to not, you know, not being able to vote. There's a whole series of events that has gone on in the in the accumulation of this Shiro journey that we're in the 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 high point, I will call it, because now we're in a place where we're we are CEOs. We are the most educated um, sex in the country. We are fighting. We we do we demand, you know, equal equal division of, of household duties and things like that with raising the kids. So we are definitely at a place where we're demanding more and more of what we believe we should have as women. And the to me, the objective and the whole purpose behind this conversation 
is how all these strides, all these years, you're talking hundreds and hundreds of years of fighting and striving for rights and things like that, for recognition, for our, our true value and our true worth other than just sex objects. And then we get to a place now in the last, I don't know, seven, eight years through social media where it's to me, it feels like it's being torn down. It feels like, you know, you know, you can see some of the most crazy things that I've ever seen in my life on social media, right on your phone. And, you know, it has a very strong following. Now, I don't have a problem with social media in itself, but as women and the objectification buy in and that being a medium for distributing this objectification buy in and promoting it as normal and OK, I, I do have a problem with it. And I see it being very harmful to the sheer evolution. And I may be, you know, stepping outside of the box here a little bit, but I see it even in terms of us back to fighting for rights for reproductive rights. You know, we're going, it seems like we're kind of going backwards. Is that because we are you know, at a point now where we're, we're more objectified as women in terms of our, our value and our worth and we need protecting from or someone to tell us what to do and how to do it because we have lost our way somehow? Um, you know, I'm going back to you, Ling. How do you see, you know, with what I just said, how do you tie those two together? Or can you tie those two together in a conversation of the harm to the evolution of women's progress and the objectification buy-in? Talking about the harm to the serial evolution, uh, we need to understand what is the concept of hero. The concept of hero or female hero celebrates women who break barriers, show the strengths, and defy stereotype, uh, stereotypical uh, roles. However, objectification buying can harm the evolution of the hero by limiting women's roles to appearance, overshadowing their talents, achievements, and leadership. When society emphasizes appearance, it risks undermining the empowerment narrative that the hero represents. This focus can discourage women from pursuing leadership roles or feeling confident in fields where their value isn't primarily physical, limiting the visibility and impact of strong, multifaceted women. And for example, if women, they always thinking about they only have to be uh, beautiful and uh, sexual appearance appeal appealing to, to the male leaders or their boss, it, they already lost their real, real self. They don't have the confidence to express or represent their own value and their own potential. Therefore, the harm to the, to the, to the uh, uh, females, or to our women or girls in this movement is very, very serious. Thank you. Laura, can you pick up from there? I was saying uh, when it comes to professional and personal, it's really important to keep, to separate the two. Because when you're in your professional, you know, zone, you really shouldn't be mixing much personal with that. Because that's where you're looked upon and you're, you're getting paid for and that's your your professional image so when it comes to the personal you know if, if you want to dress more sexy or you want to show more of a carefree i'm sorry i apologize a carefree mode it really shouldn't it should be private and not displayed on social media especially when it's in combination with your professional your professional life um i personally am pretty much on LinkedIn for social media and not so much on the other platforms. So when we talk about all of this, I, my experience is going to be more geared toward LinkedIn, which is a professional social media network. Um, so that's, that's what I would say about that. What we were, were talking about is the effect to the Shiro evolution or the, the evolving of women as sheroes, 
or as leaders, um, you know, trailblazers. So we were more referring to talking about right now is what do you think the damage to the evolution of women is by all this objectification buy-in? I, in my, from my experience, it just appears that it's actually gotten better from my experience, from when I was younger, throughout mm. the years, even in recent years, uh, I've seen uh, women have become much more of a force to be reckoned with, uh, really standing up and, and making a presence in so many different industries. And, it, and so I'm seeing less of, but again, I'm not necessarily on social media that much. I try to stay away from it. Um, I want to say also, sometimes there are women, there are young girls, they just can't help it. They have a, a natural sex appeal. They can wear something that may appear to be way more sexy than the next the next young lady that's sitting next to them. You know, it's it's just part of their essence. And so at the same time, we, we want to embrace, in a way, their, their natural traits and beauty without exploiting it. So I'm curious, and I'm going to turn a question back on you real quick. How would you be able to, like, speak to a child that would be like, like, for instance, my daughter? She has a sex appeal to her, and she always has. Mm -hmm. And she can wear things that, to me, is too much. But her sister or her cousin or one of her friends can wear the exact same outfit, and it doesn't come across in that kind of way. Well, I Does would say hi, Shauna. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How you doing? Thanks for joining. I apologize, you all. I'm running late. I've been listening to conversations. I got so many notes to catch up. I just want to keep jumping in, but great discussion <laughs> and conversation going, and I'm on fire and ready whenever you all are ready for me to join in. Okay. Well, to answer your question, Laura. Um, yes. We're talking more about, sounds like with you, is just the way one person looks wearing something versus someone else, right? Um, and, and, you know, it's a delicate balance. It really depends upon what you expose your, your daughters to, right? You can wear, you can be sexy in, in a, in a, uh, wearing a uh, just a tent dress if you have that sex appeal. So we're talking more about more provocative, I think, than sexy because we're women. We're supposed to be sexy. Shoot, I'm sexy. Shoot. So I think the sexy part of it is okay. I think there's a line though between being sexy and self-objectifying. Yes. Okay purposely being provocative to draw yes. attention um, to either, well, it could be marketing, sales, or self advancement correct? Pretty much, yes. But it even goes a step beyond that in, in what the way I'm referring to it. But Sean, I'm going to let you introduce yourself real quick and kind of jump into this piece because you have a unique organization going on. So tell us a little bit. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me or offering me a seat at the table. I'm happy to be here with you. I'm Dr. Shauna Weatherspoon. Uh, I am the founder and president of Raising Our Daughters Foundation. I have spent the last whew, 20 plus years, uh, I'm a, well, 25 now, uh, in a few industries. I actually connected with this beautiful lady who's brought all these powerful shoe rolls together through the financial services industry. And we know what the industry is made up of, like most industries that we play very well in. So I got so much to add to this conversation. I can't wait. Uh, so from financial services to killing it in those roles of doing business there, building teams, managing agencies, you know, doing all of the things we're out here doing, advocated to build wealth, to educate, to do all of the things we're, we're meant to do and created to do. And we do it well, quite frankly. Uh, as well as running real estate businesses and teams. I have been in the, I've been a real estate broker for a little over 25 years now. I've owned and operated businesses. I've managed and built others and torn others down. So there's not too many roles I haven't had in a few capacities in industries, if you will. 
I've always been in sales and leadership and management type of roles. Uh, but I do believe, and I just said this earlier today, the one thing that I know for sure that I was brought here to do in this world is to serve girls and women without question, without question. And that work for me comes from ROD, from the heart of ROD. And that work also comes from me uh, losing my mother, honestly, at a very young age. I learned a lot of things the wrong way. By the time I was 14 years old, my body was already developed like a woman. So in regard to the conversation we're having right now, that was half of my trouble my whole life. I always carried myself more mature. I always was shaped. I was very, very shapely, even as a little girl. So many things, it didn't matter, or many days and times, it didn't matter what I wore or how I wore it, if I was just built that way. Uh, that could be taken a bunch of ways. And it was a lot of times that that self-doubt and that self-confidence or the lack of self-confidence uh, and people, you know, really getting in your mindset and getting in your ear, it'll tear you down if you don't understand and know who you are and what all it is that you bring to the table. So I would say, especially in corporate America, uh, I got to a point, especially in financial services specifically, I was only wearing gray, black, brown, and maybe another safe color like cream or white. It was the most boring life ever for me, who is full of color, who loves bright colors and, you know, different kind of jazzy things. And you can still be professional. But I think the key is how you carry yourself. It is how you carry yourself. It is how you talk to people. It is how you allow people to talk to you uh, and, and vice versa and all of the things and keeping the respect on the table and making sure they understand you are there to do business. Now, all of the things they told us to go and do, I'm telling you, I'm too fired up about this one. All of the things as women in business, especially women of color, they told us to do, ladies, we went and did. And now that we've done it and exceeded them, quite frankly, and in running circles around them, you just were speaking to some of the statistics. Now you're looking, you're looked at a little differently. So you have to be careful of that too. Uh, and just personally this year alone, I've learned the hardest of ways speaking up is not always the easy route. It's never easy to speak up, but it backfires on you. So you have to be careful when you speak up, how you speak up, who you do it with and understanding all of that, because, you know, coming in and wanting to save the day and we're strong and we, and we know what we're talking about. And you're right, by the way, most of the time, it doesn't mean it's always going to work out for you in a positive way. So we have to be careful and mindful of all of those things, which leads to the company you keep. I know I've said right. a mouthful, but that's all I got for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Trendy, I'm, I, I keep uh, pivoting back to you as the younger one in the group, and then give us some feedback on that because I know we're mature. You know, we're mature mm -hmm. women. We come from different generations. We experience things differently. Um, and when we were coming up, maybe it wasn't even so much looked at as objectification. It was just the way it was, right? We were coming into learning this terminology and embracing different terminology as we evolve as women. But, you know, our day, like you said, Shawnee, you just <laughs> were a brick house. You were just a brick house. That was it wasn't any right or wrong about it. <laughs> you just were that. So comment a little bit about how you feel today with what we're talking about in terms of objectification and the extent to which some young girls go that takes it over the top. Yeah, I think um, especially I think that this objectification buy-in is like robbing young women and girls of their potential because it's pretty much placing all their value on like what they look like instead of like what they bring to the table in terms of like their mindset and their intelligence and things like that. And I think it's very interesting being in college, kind of like seeing the two different sides of that, because on one hand, we're here, we're pursuing our secondary education to be further educated and to learn more about the world and ways in which we can change it and make positive impacts using, you know, the things that we learn in the classroom and applying that in real life. And then on the other hand, it's like, since we're kind of in this college environment, 
where we're surrounded by our peers and everybody wants social acceptance. So it's like, um, like on socially, on the social aspect, it's like people are more prone, I think, to buy into the whole objectification thing and to objectify themselves because they want validation from others. So I think on one hand, it's like, um, it's like great being in this environment because we're learning more, but then on, it's on the other hand, you have, it's like, it's you're more likely to buy into the social um, acceptance and want to objectify yourself so that you're liked by other people and people place value, more value on you, if that makes sense. So I think it's just like really interesting being here and seeing how that happens. And Edna, I'm going to pivot to you on the intergenerational harm that maybe you see over your life with objectifying standards and how it disrupts women's progress um, from when you were young up to now? Because I know it's like night and day uh, what you see <laughs> and, and how easily you can access uh, very provocative imagery of women. Yeah, it's a uh, oh, wow. Yeah, because when you really talk about it, uh, you know, coming from, as she was uh, saying earlier about uh, having, you know, having this shape and you're young and even though you have the clothes that were not, uh, you know, really, I didn't feel like they were sexy. I didn't think they were sexy at all. But at the same time, you know, these are the clothes that your mom would put you in, but people would still be looking at you in a different way. And so as you grow older and things and start really like when I really got into the workplace, that's where it really happened. Because at the time when I started working at AT&T, you could only wear suits and then you had to have a jacket on. So that means is that you couldn't come in with just, you know, just a skirt and a blouse and being able to show your shape. You had to wear a jacket on to make sure that you were covered. So that was, you know, that was different going through that time. And then when you get a little, you know, you see 20 years later, you see the generation of how the young women would come in dressing differently. And it was fine. But in some cases, people thought that they were coming in, was really dressing too sexy to be around all these guys. And that was a problem. It wasn't that. They were just being who they were. So uh, even now with my granddaughter and looking at her when she just graduated from Howard and looking at her in the the girls the young ladies that she was in school with it was always they were like trying to compete with each other you know everybody was trying to compete with each other and she really had a hard time at uh, when she first got there because you know coming from texas uh you're in cities with kids from new york you know uh chicago uh and things it was a really hard adjustment for her because it was like it was like she was always competing uh, with each other, and so that has really, you know, that that has been something that I've just just looking at her generation now than where I was coming along, you know, because I was just it, it, like I said, you always had to fight, you had to fight for whatever that you wanted in this dealing in these in these uh, jobs with basically men, you know, that was it. I mean, we didn't have that opportunity. We had. You know, we had the opportunity when they when the women wanted to go outside in the field and minority women even had a harder a harder time because at that time they did not want us out there. And so, you know, having and getting out there and then having to deal with what you had to put up with to be able to stay there because I just refused to not let them run me off when I wanted to make the same money that they made. So I, I think that looking and it's, and it's kind of the same way even now with our young when our young lady because I feel like sometimes they think that because they're young you know they're not mature enough or they you know they're not experienced enough but these young women are phenomenal they can do anything and I think that's what we have to continue putting in their minds is that there's nothing that they can't do if it did it in my time when I came I started to work in 1969 at at and so if, if we could do it then you guys can definitely do it now okay right and thank you shauna 
I'm going to pivot back to you a little bit. This is something we already talked about, but I know with your organization, Raising Our Daughters, I was curious as to how you would respond to this question. So okay. tell me in your words, what your understanding of the objectification buy-in means and how do you approach it in your philosophy with Raising Our Daughters? So for me, I think when I think about the word and what it means today, and I've been, again, tuning in to every, even at the queen who was just talking, I was just thinking of uh, my daughter's college experience at Clark Atlanta, very, very uh, forthcoming. It was like walking on a movie scene day one and they're going to class. So I can relate to a lot of that and saying, okay, like I can remember when I'm thinking about what the question is right now. I can remember a time when we held back in like even how we wore our hair and things because you didn't want to express yourself because you wanted to show up and play and be there for all of the right reasons. Well, I think the younger generations of women, they don't feel that way at all. They feel like they can put it all out there and they are showing up like big, ready to go and ready to play. And that's still I have to tone myself even back down because that is who we raised them to be. So it's very interesting how you see from generation to generation how that messaging, whether we said it or we didn't say it, and how they took it and ran with it to be who they are. So how I look at it today is I try to be a better listener. I try to be more open in saying, even my daughter just the other day, who's now 31, is my oldest daughter. There are things we just don't agree about with how she dresses in corporate sometimes, or, or she dresses fine in corporate, but it's her social media page that stresses me out and keeping my blood pressure up. So I've had to understand to not shut her down or younger people down um, from not talking to us at all and expressing themselves because that is who we told them to be. Let me learn. Let me hear why this is important to you, but let me show you as a mentor, as a, as a leader now in your world, and I want to be in it, queen, and support you. But let me game you up with some wisdom and knowledge so it doesn't eat you up in the process of, of trying to become something in many cases through all of this social media stuff that doesn't even exist in real life. So let me give you the confidence skills you need so you're not so focused on what you look like versus what you bring to the table and the impact you make when you're at those tables. And that's to me, if, right. when you understand the confidence and their inner beauty and all of that, That'll when we get to doing that work, but we have to be able to do that work. And in order to get there, that requires us all to be better listeners and to not yeah. look down on each other. We build each other up. And that I think we get looked at in that way a lot of times. So we shut it completely down because they take it as we're judging them. And then look yes, and look right. at where we are today. Judging them and what, what are you saying? Yes. yes. Uh, so them we're you know making them feel bad about we're lowering their confidence when they're yes we are yeah. and guess what they are they are their clap back means they're sexier that means they're more out there they i know i think that's a lot of it and, and i'm guilty of it too i'm guilty of it too so working yeah. on it yeah. working yeah, it's, on it's a it. okay. in progress yeah because again mom is a whole lot more uh, stringent when it comes to that kind of stuff than dad. He, he tends to be able to handle it a little bit better than mom. Mom has flown off the handle many a times, you know, so. Well, okay. Well, let's just wrap this up. We've been talking about an hour now. So um, I'm going to start with you, Ling. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. I want to see what your thoughts are on how this behavior can be changed. Um, how to change this behavior um, is associated with the uh, starting with raising the awareness and shifting the societal standards. Education uh, in media literacy can help individuals recognize and then resist objectifying messages, encouraging people to value and highlight qualities beyond physical appearance is essential. As is promoting diverse body types and rejecting narrow beauty standards. And positive role models, inclusive advertising and community-based efforts 
will in, uh, reinforce self-worth beyond appearance are also crucial. Individually practicing uh, self-compassion and focusing on personal achievements and the contributions can foster a more balanced self-view. And as the society, as the uh, organizations, the leadership in the organizations should have a inclusive leadership style. It will be playing a very powerful role in reducing the obje uh, objectification buy-in among uh, women by uh, fostering an environment that values diverse contributions and emphasizes respect for individual identity beyond appearance. And so we will have several steps to go, but uh, I will leave that to our other panelists. Thank you. Edna, how would you wrap this up? How do we, now we can't, I, I say this, um, and I should probably say it over again, change this behavior. We really can't change their behavior, but how can we be a better influence? And like, like Lynn says, instituting certain expectations in the workplace and in the media and just being in charge that way, because you know you really can't change a person, right? The person has to change themselves. And with our the impressions that they see in this world and in life, social media, wherever it is, you know, a lot of it is influential. It influences them. But how do we teach them not to be so influenced that they lose themselves? How do we as you know, individuals contribute to that? And I know we're talking about a drop in the bucket, right? In terms of how much any one of us can influence this objectification buy-in. But I think just the conversation itself and having it on a larger and larger platform, it will force people to at least take a look at it. You, you know, you can't change something that you don't feel like needs to be changed. Right. So until the conversation is out there to a point where people are talking about it and there's going to be a lot of pushback, which is fine. People are supposed to express themselves. But we do understand that this objectifying behavior hurts us. It hurts our progress, especially when it's to the extreme. So, Edna, what would your comments be on affecting change to this behavior? Well, first, you've got to love yourself. And living in a neighborhood that I was born and raised in, uh, which we have, uh, you know, a lot of our young ladies that are actually living, uh, you know, kind of in the projects. And we, we go in there a lot just to talk to them, to just make them feel just because of where you're living does not mean that you cannot love yourself and respect yourself in a way around whoever it may be. And speaking out, uh, sometimes speaking out, uh, you find yourself that people think that you're trying to be uh, mean or just, you know, just real negative, but it's not that. But you have, if you, if you feel a certain way, you just can't sit back and hold it in. And mostly a lot of times when you see a lot of uh, sometimes girls that's in, in uh, uh, that, that I'm around a lot is that, you know, they like to like hate on each other. And that's something that that we really have to work on. I started uh, with my organization, Acres of Angels. I started a Women Empowerment Summit when I retired in 2012 because I got so tired of just hearing women just cutting each other down and it just bothered me. I say, let me do something different to see how we can empower them. You know, everybody have their own story. Everybody has lived a different life, but it does not matter because if you love you, my, my mother as a, as a young girl used to put me in the front of the mirror and, and say, look at yourself, love you. And let me tell you what, that, that went with me all my life. I don't care who I'm around. I don't care who it is. I don't care what education or whatever it is. I love me and I can get in front of anybody. It doesn't matter who it is because that was instilled in me. And I think that's what we've got to start instilling in our young women, because like you said, we can't change them. This is a different generation. They're going to 
dress different. They, they, that's just who they are. But if they love themselves, then it doesn't matter who they're around because they'll be able to, to be able to uh, accomplish anything in the workplace or wherever they're around. But you gotta love you first. Mm -hmm. Laura, how would you wrap this up? That was great, Ms. Edna. I love that. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Um, making sure that we come across and we focus on what is what is their strengths, what are their talents, what do we see, what do we envision for them, you know, in the future. And it's not just based on what they look like and the way that they look is going to get them there. It's kind of like that's on the side. It's really what's on the inside and that confidence. To and I kind of understand the other one too. It's kind of like if you have that confidence, then you can show more. But it's to be able to handle yourself in in that kind of way to to know right from wrong as well and to know how you're coming across when you are around the opposite um, the gender. But it's it's truly about embracing the talents, the strengths of each child to make them feel and have that confidence that just radiates from within. That it doesn't matter pretty much what they look like on the outside because the inside just radiates outside. So perfect. That's perfect. Shauna. Everything I've heard so far, I'm saying yes to. I think uh, uh, one of my favorite quotes is saying, if it is to be, it is up to me. So I'm the change I want to see in this world. And I refuse to keep waiting with, um, all of, with based on all of what I'm seeing lately. So I think by showing up as the positive example, being open, being the light, you know, even with your social media, like program what you're programming. Make sure it's positive. Make sure it is uplifting. It speaks to you. It sets the tone and how you carry yourself. Trust me, they want to they want to know more about that. So be open, be courageous to have the conversations and let's keep building because they're needed. They're needed more than ever. And we've done way too much work to, do, to let that go to waste or to let it go back in any other direction, but a positive direction. Let's so let's move forward together. Better right. together. And Trinity, I, I close it out purposely with you because, you know, we really want to be able to connect with your generation. We really need to know how to reach you. So yes. you give us the real deal and how, you know, we can work as the, the adults in the room. Well, I'm not saying you're not an adult, but you know what I mean. How we can help your generation to not just squander so much of their talent, wasting it on objectifying behaviors. Yeah, so I think the best thing that we can do to combat the objectification buy-in is pretty much what the other panels were saying, and that's promoting self-love. Because I think that if people are taught to value more of like their inner beauty than their outer beauty, then that's what they're gonna do. And so I think that we need to make like put more of an emphasis on showing people that, you know, what's on the inside is more important than what's on the outside. And I think in addition to that, um, we need more positive models to look up to because I think oftentimes people see. And so if people are only exposed to, you know, other women and girls objectifying themselves and then being praised for that, then they're also going to follow that example. So I think that we need more um, women who are, um, pretty much like defying that and doing the exact opposite. And they're really letting like their inner beauty shine and their personality and their intelligence. And that'll encourage other young women and girls in my age group to do the same. Yes. Well said, well said. Yeah. Well, thanks ladies. I'm so glad you took the time for this. Um, we will be um, putting this recording out after we polish it up on the 19th. So we are encouraging you all to share it mm -hmm. in your social media um, so that we can engage other conversations, other people into the conversation because, you know, it's, it's getting worse and worse out there. I, I, I'm not really a big social media person either. I might post Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, mm -hmm. I got a new grandbaby, you know, very kind of selective about it. And I, I wasn't even aware of these things called private rooms or something like that. It's some kind of 
way that women are, my goodness, I probably don't even want to go into that, but you all know what I'm talking about. So we're just taking this objectification to a whole nother level. And we already have a huge problem with sex trafficking and kids being kidnapped and all kind of crazy things. And this is not helping. We really do, like you said, have to promote self-love, self worth and making these beautiful ladies understand you are way more than your physical beauty um, because with time all of that fades but your inner beauty will live forever so we definitely need to get the word out there so please um share this on your show social media so that we can engage more people even if they totally disagree with us at least they're having a conversation about it take the next step to discover the Shiro within you. Take the Shiro personality quiz to uncover your unique Shiro type. Find out if you are a badass, an intellectual, a leader, nurturing, or a silent Shiro. Click the link in the description to take the quiz.